Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, so um, we're going to have Brian um, from Cascada come and present. Um, and so uh, he's going to be presenting on declarative temporal queries with Cascada. So go ahead. Yeah. All right, hey everybody. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so my name is Ryan Michael. Um, I work with Datasax. Um, and I want to talk with you guys a little bit about uh, some of the kind of ideas that we developed as we were building this tool called Cascada. Um, so what we're going to do agenda wise, do a quick background on what the problem we were trying to solve with this tool was originally run through some of the kind of ideas that we developed and the abstractions that we built around those. Give you some kind of examples of what it's like to actually use these in practice talk about the implementation, and then if we have time, a, a quick run through a case study. But first, I want to do a brief background on kind of where do we come from. This Cascada project has a slightly different history than I think a lot of open source projects. We began as a, as a startup in 2018. We were trying to build a kind of way for data scientists to work more effectively. We pivoted in about two years to kind of focus on this compute technology that we built to power the kind of application we built. Um, that kind of changed our focus to be more of an API and a data processing layer and less of a sort of user-facing application. We were acquired earlier this year by Datastax to kind of help build out their AI capabilities. And we were able to release the project, which was previously a sort of SaaS offering as an open source project, uh, Apache 2 license on GitHub in March. Um, and then just a month or two ago, we kind of changed how it's packaged to be a Python native um, library that you can just use for, for kind of data science and uh, generative AI. So let me step back a minute and kind of talk about what we were trying to solve as a startup and kind of what the problem domain that we're working in is. And it's primarily around real-time AI or ML, depending on you know, how far back you want to go. So what do we, what do we mean by real-time AI? Um, a couple of examples of things that we've either built ourselves or we've talked to people about building um, one example is kind of smart notification. So we have an application we'll look at in a minute that's sort of trained on all of the users in a Slack workspace, monitors all the conversations as they're happening. Let me move this up so it's, um, and kind of notifies people when there's conversations that it thinks they might be interested in that they're not already participating. In. Um, similarly, you can imagine an application that's watching what's happening within an institution, observing when there's new information being produced, like here's a new document indexing that in a knowledge base and then helping people to find that information dynamically as they're describing problems that it might help solve. Another example is kind of an ops co-pilot. So you can imagine having something that helps you understand when your systems are failing, whether you need to auto scale up or down and does that based on real-time analysis of logs so that it can kind of act in the moment. And what all of these have in common is this pattern of being able to make decisions based on recent information, being able to act in the moment to provide value. And there's a couple of problems with this, a couple of challenges with this type of AI specifically. So like any model, it needs to be trained on data, right? You have to teach it what to do. The difference here is that to be able to make decisions in real time, the examples you give it have to reflect really granular views of the past. We need to have the same granularity in our training examples that we're using in our inference. This means we need to be able to make examples of what was happening in the past with sort of sub minute granularity and not just any time in the past. We need to be able to identify the specific instance in time when the model would have been used. So if I'm gonna make a prediction anytime someone comes to my webpage or anytime there's a alert from a service, I need to build training examples that reflect those points in times. And I need a way of describing those to be able to iterate on the, the definition that training set effectively. So one of the big risks that building these kinds of models runs is having what we call temporal leakage. When you're building a training data set, over the past year or two, you know more than the model would have known when it made a prediction a year ago. And it's very easy to accidentally bake that knowledge into the features that you're building and build a, a model that can only make predictions accurately if it can see the future. Um, the other big problem here is that we've got two different problems to solve that have different shapes. The first is we need to build this historical training data set from our historical data. And the second, we need to take that same analysis, that same feature definition, and compute it in real time to be able to make decisions in the moment. So just to kind of look at what this looks like schematically, right? We have this first process on the top where we're taking historical data, putting it through some sort of computation to build examples, fine tuning or training, depending on whether we're talking about generative or kind of predictive use cases. 
then we need to do roughly the same thing, but in real time, right? We need to take events as they arrive, apply roughly the same type of computation to produce a single prediction. Um, and we want these two paths to have roughly the same logic. So this is the sort of domain that we were trying to work on is how can we help data scientists solve you know, this problem of getting from their historical data to models and their real-time data to predictions. And we kind of went through a series of evolutions in terms of how we thought about this problem that I wanna kind of walk through sort of what our thought process was to kind of share how we got to this idea of timelines. The first thing that we identified early on, this is one of the first kind of like things that came out of early conversations about what the problem domain looks like is that in most cases, ML and AI use cases involve an initial group by something like a user or some other entity. Um, this is related to how models work. They need to make a large number of predictions. Otherwise, it's not really an ML model. It's just a statistical description. Um, and oftentimes, the predictions that are being made are scoped to some restricted domain of what do I know about a user? What do I know about a locality? What do I know about um, a particular instance of a, a service or something like that? Um, and so we borrowed this idea of entities from a lot of the kind of data science libraries um, where this has become a fairly standard way of thinking about things. And we baked this into the sort of semantic layer that we built on top of this. One of the things that this gives us is it, it allows join predicates to be kind of implicit. We are able to avoid a lot of kind of repetitive boilerplate, you know, join on user and time, join on user and time, join on user and time by just pushing this into the semantics of our kind of um, query description language. The other thing is obviously when you're dealing with real-time data, you're dealing with raw data. Data scientists often work in fact tables or other sort of um, post-processed data sources where they've got information that's been rolled up and cleaned. When you move into a real-time context, you don't have any of that. You have to do that yourself. Um, and in order to build these sort of more um, higher level understandings of what's happening in the world, we really need aggregation. Aggregation is core to what we do. But in reality, 90% of what we're doing is just counting. It's just how many times has something happened over this time span or since the last time a user arrived at my site or something like that. Primarily very simple things. We need to be able to support more complex aggregations, but from a usability perspective, this is what most ML is built on, it turns out. Um, another thing that we see really frequently is that oftentimes we'll need to do the same aggregation over three or four different kind of window definitions or time, time spans. Um, and so we really wanted to think about ways that we could support this kind of simple reuse of the same operation over different over different, different time horizons. So what we started to recognize is that when we start building these aggregations, fundamentally an aggregation is spanning multiple events. What we end up with is we have a persistent value, which is if we're doing a count, for example, we're going to process events as they arrive. We're going to throw those events away. But the count we're going to keep, that count is a persistent value that we always have access to. And so we have two different types of information. We have the information that's instantaneous. That's just, I'm processing this event right now, and therefore I can read values from it. And we have persistent values, which is I've aggregated some state in an accumulator somewhere. And these have different operational behaviors. I can always access the one, but I only have access to the other in some cases. And so what this means is that there's implications on when I can combine values reliably or not. Um, we ended up thinking about a couple of different ways of describing this distinction in our kind of way that we describe queries. Um, and we landed on kind of an idea of interpolation or continuous versus discrete, which we'll look at here in just a second. The last thing I want to talk about before we kind of talk about what a timeline is and why we think it's interesting um, is the need for what we're kind of calling synthetic or infinite set values. So a lot of data that you process is gonna be coming from events, right? Somebody does a thing, you observe a fact about the world at a point in time. But if we wanna do things like aggregate daily, daily is not a data set. Daily is this abstract idea about at the beginning of time each day, uh, there's a boundary condition. Um, the kind of naive way of doing this, the way that this is often done in like SQL is that you'll take your data, your events, you'll truncate all of their timestamps to the nearest timestamp that gives you a value you can group on that value. Um, that works really well, except if you need to recognize when something didn't happen. 
if you have a date or a time that's not present in that data set, you will not get that out. So this causes you to need to do all sorts of weird things with phantom data sets that you join in and out. It's, it's really ugly. And so we started looking at, well, what if we just described this synthetic data set of the beginning of time each day? Obviously, that's an infinite set. So we need to solve a boundary condition problem. Um, so we kind of elected to basically provide semantics around that, where what we'd say is this set begins the first time associated with a value in your data, and then it ends at whatever now is or when the when the user asks us to, to terminate the computation. So these are all the sort of like considerations that we were thinking about. And they brought us to this idea of timelines. This kind of evolved over fits and starts, a couple of different versions. And where we landed was this idea of timelines as a way of synthesizing all of this together into a coherent whole. Um, if you imagine drawing a data set that's events, oftentimes you'll probably draw something very similar to this if you just draw it on a, on a whiteboard, right? We've got time along the horizontal axis. We've got value on a vertical axis. Um, maybe this is a line if you're dealing with kind of non-scalar non values. Um, but it's a really intuitive way of thinking about how things change across time that gives you this geometric visualization of these two dimensions. On the one hand, you can think about how the value changes, and you can, or the, you know, the different values you're working with. And on the other hand, you can reason really easily about time and how those relationships um, exist. And what we like about this is that it kind of brings all these ideas together, right? So as you can see here, when we talk about the values in a timeline, they're keyed by entity. So all of these um, aggregations that you're seeing here in the bottom, those are aggregated by entity. Um, we can see really clearly how temporal aggregation will work here. So what we're doing here is just kind of counting, or I guess we're doing a sum here. Um, and so we have an easy way of kind of thinking about the aggregations we wanted to do. You can see here the two examples of what we call kind of continuous on the bottom and discrete on the top. So this is just recognizing the difference between these values that we can always evaluate versus the values that only happen at particular points in, in time. Um, and then we're not showing this here, but baked into the aggregation mechanisms that we have are what we kind of call periodic windows. So what we recognize is that this synthetic data set really is only needed for aggregation and filtering, really. Um, and so we kind of baked that into the definition of windows. This is sort of an abstraction of things like timers that exist in like Flink. So with this idea, we kind of have this type primitive in a sense that we can operate on. So we can basically take one set of events and then sum it or count it and get a new, a new timeline. We can kind of always operate with this time axis, which makes it very easy for us to do this sort of time traveling that we need to do for the, the machine learning example generation. But what we realized is that, you know, this abstraction started to suggest new ways of thinking about things as well. Um, so we talked about um, time leakage, not wanting to be able to train your model on data that's, that's from the future. One of the things that's very unusual about building these machine learning examples is that if I'm making a prediction about the future, to build that training example, I need to compute the thing I'm predicting at a different point in time than I wanna compute the input to that model because I'm predicting the future. So being able to compute at different points in time and bring them together in a meaningful way is really important. And what we realized is that there's a simple sort of visual analogy we can use here, of moving these timelines relative to each other that allows us to describe that relationship. So what we can say is compute my features shift them forward in time by an hour and then compute the result. And that allows us to do a you know slice of combining features and predictions that are kind of at the same point in time in the, in the timeline. So I'm gonna run through some code examples of kind of where we are. As I mentioned, uh, the current implementation is in Python. This is because we're primarily looking at making <clears throat> AI and generative AI easy to use for non-data engineering experts. Um, so here's what this kind of looks like. Uh, it's a very simple hello world operation working on batch data. We can pull in some data as a CSV. Uh, we can count it. We can convert it to a pandas data frame. So this is you know, the, the, the bare minimum. Uh, but what you can see is that there's no infrastructure here. It's a simple Python library. We can do this in real time as well. In this example, we're kind of faking it. Um, but we can build effectively a source of events 
describe its schema, and then dynamically load data um, over time. What we've done here at the bottom is we've changed how we're running this operation. Originally, we were just converting it to a pandas data frame, which is a batch operation. We're gonna just take all of the inputs, convert it to the outputs. In this case, what we're doing is we've created an asynchronous iterator. We've told it, I want you to do live mode, which means you know streaming, and then produce values as the data is appended to the data source. So I talked a lot about the different kinds of transformations that we were interested in supporting. And here's a couple of examples of the, of the main kinds that we would do. On the very top, we're doing a simple filter. So this takes the events we looked at previously and just filters them down to a smaller set. On the second line, we're building a record. So we're building a composite data structure. Um, we're using a couple of different types of aggregation here. So we're counting, we're summing. Um, we have a bunch of other ones as well. Um, we've got a couple of different types of windows going here. We've got a sliding window, which is, you know, as you would expect. Um, we've got a sense window. So this is effectively um, a window that emits every time there's an input, but then resets at the beginning of each day. So this lets you do things like how many times has something happened today? Um, so we've got a number of different windows. This is not an exhaustive list, but that's kind of the beginning. On this next line down here, what we're looking at is how we can change that entity. So obviously if you introduce an entity, you don't want to be limited by that indefinitely. Um, so of course you can just change the key. Um, the one kind of different way that we structure working with these multiple entities is that we've introduced what we call a lookup operation. So what lookup allows you to do is to take a timeline that's defined for one entity and then look up the value with respect to another entity. So what we're basically saying is I want to take the regional average and look it up for the region associated with a particular event. So under the hood, we're doing a bunch of manipulations around, you know, what is the domain of each of these expressions? What is the entity of each of the expressions? What is their continuity? Um, allowing you to um, do this more safely than you would be if we were just doing this, this raw. Uh, and then we're also doing what we call a preview operation down there, which is just, actually, no, <laughs> that is old code that should not have been. Or is that? No, no, sorry. I'm losing context. Yes. The preview down here is basically just saying, like, take the first five rows. So I just want to see, like, is this computing sane values or not? Um, so no, super exciting. And because we're in Python, we can just write UDFs really easily. Um, we've got a little bit of cruft up here from, so originally this was built as a independent language. Uh, we called Fennel for feature engineering language. Um, when we converted to Python, we basically baked all of that into a Python builder syntax. Um, so we have a little bit of just kind of function declaration up here that we're planning on removing, but right now you still have to provide. Um, and so you can just apply Python easily. Obviously, this is far less performant than what you would get if you were running this natively. The engine itself is written in Rust on top of Apache Arrow. All of the native operations that we've implemented are much faster than these, but oftentimes what you would want to use Python for is applying an embedding model or doing some inference to augment the data that you're processing. And those are gonna be orders of magnitude slower than the data processing that we're doing anyway. So generally not as big of a deal. So that's kind of the overview of how you would use it. Um, obviously, we want to be able to do this efficiently. Otherwise, there's, there's not much point in, in building all, this whole system. And there's a couple of things that we've kind of been able to leverage to build a really efficient runtime for this. The first, time, the first thing is that we've sort of inverted something that I think is spoken about in the Flink community, which is that we kind of treat streaming as a special case of batch. Um, we built the engine in Rust, as I mentioned, on top of, a, of Arrow, which gives us really fast columnar operations. We did this because the limiting factor in the machine learning kind of AI workflow is often just the iteration cycle time when you're trying to find what features are predictive. And so being able to do historical analysis in batch mode really effectively um, is really important. It turns out if you've got an engine that's really good at that, it can oftentimes handle you know, micro batches of, of streaming data also very efficiently. The second thing is that there's a lot of um, features of this timeline abstraction that we can use to build optimizations into the runtime. Right? So timelines are ordered, they are keyed. We can use all of that to optimize the execution. Um, and then the, the final thing that we do is we obviously with streaming implement an incremental runtime of this. One of the things that's a little bit different about way, the way that we built incremental is that we designed it from the start to be something you could run periodically. What that does is it allows you to trade off 
how batchy your operation is versus what the latency end to end is. Obviously, batchy operations are more efficient. So if you run something periodically once, a, once every five or 10 or an hour, five or 10 minutes or an hour or something like that, you can potentially trade off some performance um, for, for latency. Um, in terms of just raw performance, you know, we've done a couple of benchmarks against like DuckDB. Uh, DuckDB, if you're not familiar, is a um, analytic SQL database for local applications, super fast. What we found is that even without a whole lot of optimization on our side, we're kind of competitive with them in, in most applications. The one bar, that big one that says history, what that's doing is doing historical analysis to be able to construct point in time views of past data sets. We are substantially faster there because of some of these optimizations that we're going to talk about in a second, um, because that's just not what a lot of these data processing systems are optimized for. And so we can we can generate historical data sets much more efficiently. So let me talk about the first big reason that we can do this quickly. It has to do with this, what we call temporal locality, right? When we're doing something as a streaming engine, most of the values we're producing are going to depend on other values that are in roughly the same temporal region. If they're not, they're often going to be aggregations that just depend on an accumulator or something like that. Um, so what this means is that we can do things like read the files in temporal order. So we can bound the, the set of inputs that we're working with. Obviously, in a streaming world, this is not as much of a concern. Um, when we're building these aggregations, if we're doing something like a rolling window, it means that conceptually at least, we can throw away the old windows. We don't need to keep those accumulators around. We don't need to keep that count in place. We can just have the current one open and move forward with that. Um, and then we can do things like as of join or point in time join. So naively, if you were building this with like SQL or something, you might have to build two data sets. And then if you wanted to join them in time, you would need to do a bunch of lookups between them. Because we're processing data chronologically at any given point in time, we can just say, um, look up this other value for this other entity, and then we'll get a point in time lookup, um, just kind of just falls out of the processing model. Um, I just fast forward through this. So, you know, the other thing that we can take advantage of is that it's a lot faster to maintain order once you have it than it is to sort it on demand. We, in our processing model, stipulate that everything is chronological, which means we can just sort the data as it arrives chronologically. And then to process it, we just need to merge it. This is just a quick merge sort. Um, so we can we can do this very efficiently, and we don't ever really need to sort it again. Um, moving to the kind of incremental side, we do a fairly standard thing here. Like we snapshot the state of our accumulators. This allows us to terminate the process, come back again later. Um, it's not a whole lot of interesting stuff in here, uh, but there's something a little different in how we handle this. So some of you are probably wondering, uh, when I mentioned about throwing away windows, how do we handle late data, right? Late data is sort of the, the bane of streaming existence in a lot of ways. Um, so one way we handle this is fairly standard, right? We have a Slack buffer. We accumulate data for a certain amount of time. We throw away, throw away any data that's older than that amount of time. Um, but we have another way of looking at this that I think is somewhat unusual. We have these snapshots that we're creating periodically. This allows us to recover from failure. Um, but what we do is we do what we call optimistic late data handling, which is that we just process the data as it arrives as though you know, there's not ever going to be any late data. In many cases, that's true, right? If we're talking about data science use cases where the data is being added dynamically within the process, they might just be using the system clock and we don't actually need this. So introducing the complexity of watermarks and all that kind of stuff may just be making things more complicated for the user without actually solving a problem. But what happens when we do get late data? What we can do is we just roll back to the previous snapshot and then play back forward. So what we can do is we can do this on a per entity, sometimes per operation basis, and effectively just rewind time briefly, pull it back forward, um, and then have it the, the correct state at any given point in time. What this means is that we don't have to delay processing or we don't have to delay delivering results we're trading off the possibility of having to restate results there. Um, this is not super mature in the current implementation. Uh, we kind of lost some functionality when we transitioned to Python. So this is still being kind of implemented. So this is more like, uh, it's more like an idea than something I can show you benchmarks on. Um, 
And so just to kind of like show where this has taken us, um, this is a quick example that we looked at or that we built as a demo. Um, this is the first example I mentioned in terms of the use cases. This is a chatbot that we built. Um, you can download your full Slack history, train it on like who cares about what, and then it'll notify you like, hey, there's a conversation going on. Uh, this is Preeti, he's a product manager at DStacks, um, mentioning something about like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna make a decision here. And so the bot says, hey, you, you probably ought to participate in this conversation because it's relevant to you. Um, I don't know where we are on time. So I've got a brief, I can run through really quickly what the implementation of this looks like. Um, just kind of show what this looks like in a finished application. Um, this is the sort of real-time handling that we use to power BeepGPT. It's also available if you want to want to take a look at that. Um, so we're setting up some stuff. We're initializing some services right there. We're creating this data source like we saw previously. This is empty. We're going to add to it dynamically. Uh, we use the Slack API to receive messages in real time. So we're just setting that up, creating a handler. Um, this is the actual logic there. We're basically just receiving messages. After we parse them, we're adding them into the into the set of values that are part of the computation. And then we're done there. This is the kind of handler for the conversation. So the first thing we do is we define some operations here. So in this case, we're building a conversation. We're aggregating across multiple messages to build a view of what's happening in Slack for a given thread in a given channel. So really simple. As I said, many of these data kind of data or machine learning AI aggregations are not super complex. This is basically just pulling out a couple of fields after changing the key and then collecting a list of 20, 20 comments. Um, we've got a UDF here. We apply some formatting so that it's in the format that the OpenAI expects. Um, and then we handle each one of these conversations as they're produced. We get a row, we send it to OpenAI. We do a bit of work to figure out who should be notified and we send them a notification. Um, so that's kind of the extent of it. Um, so I think, just to kind of conclude, the goal here in a lot of ways, especially in the current iteration, was to take some of the complexity of stream processing and make it more accessible to people who are non-experts. Make this something that a data, a developer rather, that just wants to build some sort of application around generative AI or something, for example, can just get started, look at a couple of examples, and just be ready to go um, without having to understand complex infrastructure, should be systems engineering, all that sort of stuff. And what, we, what we've tried to provide here is a, is a simpler way of reasoning about this problem and a, a, an engine in a runtime that's really optimized for kind of efficiency and getting started quickly. Um, obviously, I would love to have more people involved in this project. Um, so if you'd like to join Slack, I'd be happy to kind of like talk with you guys more about that. Um, link to the project. Uh, the example I, looked, I showed br briefly is right down there. Uh, you can take a look at that, train it on your own. You're in Slack organization and whatnot. Um, that's what I got. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so there's a question is it a library? Uh, it is right now. So, right now, the core of it is implemented in Rust, as I mentioned. So, we just use PyO3, we just provide FFI bindings. So, it's a Python library um, that will run in real time mode. You don't need to have any infrastructure. If you want to like read from Kafka, Kafka or Pulsar or whatever, you know we've got connectors for that, so you can stream data into it. Um, but no, there's there's no infrastructure to manage at the at the moment. Um, so, yes. Okay, so the question is sort of like what what are the resourcing requirements? So. I don't have great numbers for what it's what what happens in real time. Um, in batch mode, if we're just like reading data out of Parquet, like this computer will process somewhere in the order of millions of rows a second. Um, in streaming mode, what we see is that generally the Python process is the limiting factor because it's getting the requests in and like parsing the JSON or whatever is more expensive than us doing the actual like adding and you know, all the stream processing. The stream processing is almost never the limiting factor. It's almost always IO, basically. IO and or Python, so. Mm -hmm. Is there some way to 
Yeah, so the question is like, how do we do state management and snapshotting? So this is one of the things that um, has not been fully ported over to Python yet. Um, when we were a standalone service, we had this well solved and we had like a separate service. We're still implementing that for the Python implementation, but the goal is yes, to be able to have, um, you point it at a backing store, whether that's something like Cassandra or a local disk or whatnot. Um, and then it will take care of managing the state for you as the process process um, makes progress, I guess. Um, so th that's actually the complexity of managing that state is one of the things that we wanted to abstract away from users. I think you know this is a common thing in you know, many stream processing systems. This is a hard problem to solve. And so yeah, we want we want to make sure that that's a very simple, simple problem. Yes. Yeah, from the IATDP project, so we're, we're sort of like, it seems like you're also sort of like so like more in the batch processing of time data, it seems like this would be actually a very well fit to sort of like bring together, let's say, uh, all the features of let's say batch processing and time related data with stream processing. Because we're currently trying to sort of like transition from sort of like learning from what data we have for the last few months and transitioning to some reactive system. So it really sounds like it's kind of could be a nice fit to join in with that. That would be a perfect data store for it. Yeah, so I guess uh, to summarize maybe like other applications of IoT. Um, I, yes, so this is something that we actually, before we made this pivot to like really focus on generative AI, one of the things we were thinking about was could we do like edge computing really effectively, right? Because um, running something like Spark or Flink on like an embedded device is probably not gonna work great. Whereas our engine, it's Rust, it's very efficient. We can compile it down to whatever. Um, I think there's opportunities there. Um, and in terms of just like handling IoT data, that's certainly something that we've we've talked to people about doing in the past. So I think that's a good use case. I'm not sure if that's exactly, I, I agree, I guess is the, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, can we integrate with Kafka? Yes. Um, so I think uh, right now, Right now, the Kafka integration is read from Python, hand it to the process, but we're working with, like, we have a branch where we've almost completed like a Rust native uh, Kafka connector, um, which will obviously be a little bit more performant. Um, and so, yeah, I think the system was originally designed to be able to deal with both sort of batch data and like a data lake or something like that, as well as reading from, um, th this idea that I showed right here, where we're just like handling data dynamically out of the Python process is very recent. Like we introduced that like a month or two ago. Um, the system was originally designed specifically for, yes, let's read data out of Kafka um, mm -hmm. and process it as it comes in, so, yep. So yeah, thank you for doing a talk about making things declarative because it's, um, you know, a lot of people talk about the, end, the fantastic engine they built, however, it's, it's actually great to think about the, um, the query model, the mm -hmm. data model, and that's hard work. Yeah. Um, um, it reminds me that your work seems related to a, a lot of concepts in other fields, like this is what Chris was talking about. Um, so like time series databases, you know, there's, there's a lot in common. Um, I'm giving a talk on Monday about adding measures to SQL. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make so measures are very similar to your timelines, except we don't treat time as a, as a special case. So you could say, what was the profitability of this product in this region in this year? And therefore, you can, you can teleport in, across, the, you can move backwards and forwards in any of your dimensions, right. not just time. Seems like there's a lot of similar concepts in your work, time series, databases, um, and the other. Yeah, so pointing out similarities between SQL time series and some of the other things. I, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there's a, um, uh, like, uh, shit, what is the, anyway, I've forgotten. Some of the time series databases have similar query languages. Um, um, you know, I think the big difference between time series and time sh timelines, rather, is just the granularity, right? Like, time series are generally, like, you pick your granularity and then you accumulate into buckets effectively, which loses some resolution. Um, and you're right, like SQL, I think one of the reasons that we moved to the Python implementation is that we were constantly having conversations about like, well, why can't I just use SQL? Um, and the answer is you can, right? Like SQL has match recognized, SQL has a number of kind of like windowing operations, SQL, some versions of SQL has as of join. 
So a lot of the primitives, I think you're right. Um, what we what we kind of recognized is that we had built this query language that we called Vinyl Engine. And we squinted it out a little bit and we're like, this looks just like Python. Like, this is basically just Python. So why don't we just expose this as Python? Um, and what we like about that is that we're kind of solving a different problem. Like we're not, like I don't, I don't necessarily want to try to fix SQL, right? Like that's not our goal. Um, what we're trying to do is make it easy to use these types of operations. And what we found is that when we moved to Python, we got a bunch of benefits. We got code completion. We got um, a really easy way to document things. And it just kind of flowed. It looks very similar to like what Pandas does or something like that. Um, and so I think that we get a lot of the benefits of declarativeness in terms of like having a crisp understanding of what we're doing and exposing that in a way that's not just like, you know, mutate a value, mutate a value. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not complaining you're not using SQL. <laughs> you're, you're doing the hard work figuring out what is the data. Yeah. Once you've done that work, it makes sense to work in SQL to make it You're doing it in Python because that's where you use the Exactly. Yeah. Well, and we'd like to, I mean, something we've talked about, we haven't done this yet, but we'd like to look at like compiling this down to Wasm and providing like a JavaScript version of this. Um, we've also looked at some of the some of the thinking we've been doing around state management is exploring whether we could do this as effectively like a lambda function where we just process data um, in small increments um, so that we we're not talking about like a heavyweight constant process, but we can kind of do like for this slack example that I that I showed you, we're getting a slack message like every couple of minutes in some cases or hours even depending on what channel is stuck in. We don't necessarily need to have a persistent process for that. So being able to just stick that in like a Lambda function or like a fast service or whatever um, would be really nice. And I think would open up a bunch of interesting use cases. And if we could do that inside JavaScript, that would also be I think, really nice for just sort of in use developers being able to pull in some of this model of compute in a way that's not involving a bunch of languages that they're not familiar with or a bunch of distributed systems concepts that they don't want to learn or whatever. So. Yeah, so are we using frameworks and how do we scale? So, um, oh, schedule. Yeah, so the the bulk of the actual implementation is just built on top of Apache Arrow. So there's a really great Rust library that implements Apache Arrow. Um, Arrow, if anyone's not familiar, is a sort of uh, columnar in-memory format. Um, the Rust implementation gives you a lot of really great tooling to be able to say, um, take a big array, apply this function to it. Um, and this gives you really performant results because you can take really good use of, you know, L1 caching and CPU cache prediction or um, pre-computation and whatnot. So basically you can run through the data really quickly. Um, in terms of scheduling, we built our own scheduler basically. So we take like, here's an example. This may take longer. Yeah. So we'll take an expression like this. We'll parse it into an AST. So we'll have like a tree of like, what is the expression that we're describing? We'll compile that down into a physical plan that basically says like, well, first you need to read all the events and then you need to filter them. And then we can apply this transformation and we need to aggregate them. So we have an internal representation of the kind of um, logical process that we're going to execute. And then we just schedule that internally. Uh, we use like Tokyo in Rust to be able to do asynchronous um, operations. Um, currently, we are doing most of this, most of our parallelism right now is um, cross operation parallelism. We have a branch that we're working on actually partitioning each stage of that, um, which gets the distributed thing that you didn't actually ask about, but I'm happy to talk about it if somebody wants to talk about. Um, and so, yeah, basically we built our own scheduler that, that does all of the, the scheduling and then we just use error for the actual execution. Yep. Uh, let's thank our speaker.